about to my mom and Monty and my own siblings, Nick, Carolyn, and Barbara. I'd like to thank you all for coming out today in these turbulent times to honor the memory of my father, Ken, a man who touched the lives of many over the years. With his kindness, his warmth, his generosity, and his jovial spirit. My father was born on October 2nd, 1934, and was the peak of the Depression. Hitler, Stalin, and now consolidating power and setting the stage for the murder of Don't worry, I might not be the history of this It was, as Dickens might have described it, the worst of times. But my father was determined from an early age to make the best of those times. He was a brilliant student and would earn academic scholarships to God in the University of Toronto when he was 17. He graduated at 21. And right away, he started his first engineering job in Montreal, where he met my mother at a church social. He then, he then wooed and wed her in short order. He was married at 22, celebrated his first child at 23, his second at 24, and the fifth before he was 30. Of course, my mother did most of the heavy lifting, <laughs> seven to ten pounds at a time. Our family started out in around the uh, French Cafe of Rosemont, close to my father's job in the Shell, Hans, and Stan Oil refinery. But my dad's great old French immersion project ended in 1962 when he took a new job at Monsanto Chemical Plant in West Island, in the South. Developers were then building bungalow communities in the middle of nowhere, so in 1963 we moved to BDO. The modest house at 126 Evergreen had sprung up on a deserted pasture became a nurturing home for the next 53 years. This is where my father would prove in the best of times and the worst of times he was a man, a man of abiding courage and resilience. The first big blow was a huge overnight gas explosion at the Monsanto plant in 1966 that killed 11 employees. A hard worker in normal times, Dad spent long hours in the plant after that as they investigated the cause of the explosion and had to prevent similar mishaps going on elsewhere. When Monsanto later decided it would shutter the facility in stages, he had the painful job of delivering the news one by one to his employees. He told me it was uh, one of the hardest things that he has had to do in his working life, <coughs> telling all those men and women that they no longer had a name on it. If the explosion wasn't enough of a trial, two years later, my mother's increasingly unusual behavior erupted into psychotic break. The doctors of the Douglas diagnosed, uh, delivered a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. The understanding of the disease and the treatment for it back then was primitive, and as you can imagine, so it was stable. Lengthy and even lifetime institutionalization was common, was common. antipsychotic medications offered by other patients depressed, profoundly lethargic, and often suicidal. Mom, then 36, was literally no longer the woman he married. She was still there, the beautiful, compassionate, funny woman he felt love. But she was struggling in a turbulent sea of delusion and fear. At home were five children, aged two to nine, who were too young to understand why mom had gone away. Most men faced with that situation would have chosen an easier path, but just run away all the way. But Dad never felt there was a choice to be made. The Harvard engineer and father of five shrugged his shoulders and had a caregiver, homemaker, and cook to his duties for the next 50 years. Now, when I say cook, I use the term lightly. Whatever culinary skills my father had picked up at Lumberjack School or his university dorm have all very little over the years. Aside from the staples of sloppy joes, Salisbury steak, that will offer real hot dogs with melted cheese, tomato and lettuce salad, with bread strips dipped in maple syrup for dessert. <laughs> we had two spices in the rack, salt and pepper, and the pepper was for special occasions. <laughs> but we were never hungry. Craig was about the only thing that didn't excel at, though. He was, a, he was scary smart, and he knew the answers Talked to so many questions that his middle name should have been Google rather than Graves. His library was full of engineering texts, but also 
novels by Dickens and Twain, short stories by H.G. Wells and Peter Bobasan, and biographies and explorers and politicians. I was an avaricious reader as a young man, so out of pure boredom. That eclectic collection took me on many unexpected journeys, and no doubt launched me on my eventual career as a professional rap That also had a great sense of humor that was so dry. I think it took me 30 years before I got some of his jokes, or even understood that he was joking. <laughs> the sardonic wit was passed on to his kids with varying levels of skill. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's attended a Wheeland family dinner knows what it's like to be pummeled by so many puns at the dinner table that guests often volunteered to walk the dog <laughs> or the neighbor's dog if we didn't have one. How did that have time for all this? I'll never know. But he always did, and when he, had the, and when he had the wrong answers, we would appeal to Mom, who could usually negotiate a compromise on our behalf. Sometimes the best teacher is not just what your parents do, but what they never do. I never saw my parents fight, I never saw them live with their kids, I never saw them push us on a course of their own choosing. But they were always there to support us to guide us away from the bad paths, bad dangerous paths. My father had no tolerance for intolerance, no patience for ignorance. We were never taught prejudice to diminish someone based on skin color, religion, or gender. Hell, we even agreed to let an Irishman do that. <laughs> Dad was also one of the most generous men I've ever known. Despite all of the burdens of care in his life, he was always willing to volunteer himself for more. Two years after my mom's diagnosis, his sister Lily wrote to say she was coming back to Montreal for being with her husband and three kids. Dad insisted on making room for them in the basement of the other green house, increasing the population to 12 for six months, as Dad was busy himself seeking a new job after he too was finally laid off by Monsanto. And it wasn't just family he took in. When I was 15, one day he called me in for dinner from the park across from the house where I'd been hanging out with my friend Phil. Is your, is your friend going home for supper, he asked me. I explained that Phil's father was abused because Phil had run away. So where does he sleep, that asked. In a friend's car sometimes, sometimes in the park, and I'm in a friend's house. But, so he said that you better get right in for dinner. Over supper, my dad got Phil's story from him and told him he'd be staying with us until he got on his feet. With a stable address, Phil was able to get a, a job and have his own place that he wants to. Phil was not the last person to see that generosity. Dad did the same for my friend Cliff, whose mother was running an escort agency out of her dollar home and the best environment in the jury to But I'm happy to see Carolyn's friend Kelly and Judy's friend Nancy. Both here today, both of whom also came at different times, lived for months on 26 Evergreen, and are among many, many people who can bear witness to their father's casual compassion. In fact, most guests, especially the revolving door of kids and grandkids, boyfriends and girlfriends, would find themselves warmly greeted and gently interrogated by my father, who genuine curiosity helped turn strangers and family and children. Even after the children flew the nest, Dad continued to help out the community. After working more than 20 years in the Hunter Research Center in Point Claire, where his humor and his compassion as a boss were renowned and legendary, he volunteered in the community for decades before and after his retirement. Those who benefited from his largesse included Cheshire Foundation, a home for young adults with physical disabilities, Abitil, which assists people with mild cognitive disabilities live independently in the communities, as well as Meals on Wheels and the West Island Volunteer Bureau. What made that generosity all the more uncommon is that he never drew attention to it. He didn't boast of his good deeds, never expected praise or public acknowledgement. Dad finally surrendered our child's home just five years ago, when advanced arthritis my mom's knees turned her home to many stairs into hurdles and hazards. They sold the house and moved to an independent seniors living facility for the next three years. But when mom's arthritis took away her mobility, 
they were required to be. I say they because even though that was still the old body, there was no question of separate goals. If schizophrenia could have rolled their life long to commit arthritis in the standard chance. So that started a home for the two of them and settled on Mrs. Dom's hair and Doral. When we celebrated Mom and Dad's birthday there last September, he was spry, alert, and as jovial as ever. Aside from memory gaps typical of people of his age, there was no sign that vascular dementia was no sign that vascular dementia was soon to upset his balance, eat away his cognition, and take away his ability to walk. But my father still had his keen sense of humor there at the time when they do these cognitive tests in the hospital. You know, one of the Trump was bragging the gaze of it. They would, they would ask the, the, the physician would ask my father, do you know what day it is? And my father would say, yes. And when this physician, when they, when they said, well, you know, can you tell me what day it is? He would look at them and he would go, well, you're a doctor. I imagine you should know these things. <laughs> The decline was rapid and it wasn't long before mom and dad switched roles with her taking over as caregiver. It was as if they had a they shared a single source of energy, and as dad waned, mom's kicked in a year. She advocated for him at the residence and with the family, and she missed him profoundly during his stints at the hospital in December and January. When Heron wanted to hike the price of dad's care by 50%, she supported the tough decision to temporarily move him into the public system. To live separately for the first time in 63 years. On the day of the scheduled move, a few days after Quebec long term care homes had been quarantined because of COVID, mom was being dressed by Aaron staff for her goodbye with him. But dad was already gone, hustled by other Aaron staff into a taxi with barely a change of clothes to take him to the sea edge of South Lila South. Mom was heartbroken, had her chance to say a last goodbye and take him from especially after we found out that Dad could not be cut off completely from his family. No one had told us that the lockdown meant Dad wouldn't have to call him at the cell. We didn't have a chance to talk to him again until two weeks later, as the dual COVID dementia devil took his breath, his voice, and then his life. We are so grateful that Judy, Nick, and I were able to be with Dad in his final days. It is a mercy that too many people have not been around. Lockdowns, isolation, and the often rapid progress of the infection have meant that hundreds of thousands of men and women all over the planet have died in pain, fear, and alone at the end of their long term. As I said, Dad couldn't talk at the end, but he could. I know his first and final words would be, take care of your mother. Dad, we fought to rescue mom from Heron and then from the hospital, where COVID isolation and loneliness nearly took away her will to live. After she finally tested negative, the system insisted she be sent back to Heron, but we refused. And she has been in our care ever since. We promised her that she would never be alone again. Connie's here with us today, Dad, and she wants everyone to know great man and husband and father and companion you were, and that she loves you and misses you very much. We know mom, we feel the same.